Hi everybody, welcome to the Bereans Bible Institute. I'm Pastor Tim, your teacher. Um, we're in module number seven on the apostolic ministry and the last several lessons we have been talking about the uh, ministry of the Apostle Paul. We've gone all through his first missionary journey um, where he took Barnabas along with him. We're now talking about his uh, second missionary journey where Paul took Silas along with him and um, this is after or right after the Jerusalem Council um, where the uh, the elders and the apostles at the Jerusalem Church wrote an official document outlining what was necessary and not necessary for Gentiles who were becoming part of Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promises. Um, we looked at that the last uh, couple of lessons um, now we're, uh, we see that in chapter 16, the Apostle Paul uh, chooses a young man by the name of Timothy to be a companion along with himself and Silas. So let's begin reading in chapter 16 of Acts, verse 1. Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Now remember Lystra and Iconium are two of the uh, cities that the Apostle Paul visited on his first missionary journey with Barnabas. Um, and now we see that this is where he's picking up uh, Timothy. Uh, Paul wanted to have him go on with him and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region for they all knew that his father was Greek. Now, one of the reasons why the Apostle Paul decided to take Timothy along is because he was very impressed with this young man's reputation. You see here that he had a reputation among those who dwelt in these cities, but Paul also in his two books to Timothy, the same man, makes mention of the fact that uh, from childhood um, Timothy had known the Holy Scriptures um, which were wise, uh, which were able to make him wise to salvation, and so we also see in uh, I believe it's Second Timothy that um, he reflected the faith Paul says of his mother and his grandmother who had trained him in the Holy Scriptures since he was a young man. So we see that um, according to this passage, his mother was a Jew and his father was a Greek, and no doubt as a Greek, his father had uh, was a pagan and uh, we see here that he was uh, Timothy was uncircumcised here because it goes on to say that Paul wanted him to go with them and so he took him and circumcised him and it says why he says because the Jews who were of that re region for they all knew that his father was Greek now what this must mean is that his father had not allowed um, Timothy to be circumcised as a young man and that um, so all of the all of the responsibility of raising Timothy in the ways of God in the uh, tradition of the Jews um, apparently he, his mother and his grandmother were allowed to do that with the exception of his father would not allow him to be circumcised as a young man now Paul it says here that Paul uh, circumcised him uh, before taking him along with him on his missionary journey. Now, this seems to be a little bit at odds with the letter that um, the Jerusalem Council issued over the question of circumcision. Uh, the question was that circumcision was not necessary for Gentiles. And here's Timothy, who's half Greek, half Gentile, um, and half Jew. And... Paul then goes on and circumcises him. Now, some people might get the impression that, well, Jews then need to be circumcised. Uh, but that's really not the reason that Paul circumcised him. Paul, if you may remember, uh, Paul's primary activity was evangelism. And the way that he did that was he went to from place to place and he would start at the synagogues, right? Well, uncircumcised men were not permitted at the synagogues. It was just not allowed. Now, it's not that they physically check, but because all these people in this region, it says, knew that his father was a Greek, what they're saying is that it was well known that Timothy was not circumcised because his father was a pagan and his father wouldn't allow it. And so, in order to keep 
the peace, if you will, in the synagogues. In order to have Timothy as his companion, the Apostle Paul felt it necessary to go ahead and circumcise him and, 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 it, and let it be known that he had been circumcised now as an adult and because of that there would be no objections to him entering the synagogues along with Paul. So Paul, this, is, this was simply a matter of uh, practical um, avoiding certain potential problems that could easily have come up if uh, Paul had tried to take him in, into the synagogue as an uncircumcised uh, man. We, uh, there's another passage where uh, later in Acts where Paul has Titus with him, who's also who was a full-blooded Gentile, and um, went and, and he makes the point that when um, when he went to Jerusalem and he had Titus with him, that the Jerusalem church did not say anything about Titus getting circumcised. He had no need to be circumcised as a as a Gentile there. So it's very clear that uh, in Paul's ministry, circumcision was not an issue with regard to salvation or with regard to um, uh, being pleasing or acceptable to God. It was purely um, a practical matter in Paul's mission, uh, ministry because he was preaching to Jews. All right, so let's continue reading in uh, Acts chapter 16. It says, verse 4, And they went through the cities and delivered to them the decrees to keep. That is the letter that was issued by the Jerusalem council. Um, uh, which, was, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Now, I think this is an important statement. It may seem, um, it may not seem that important on the surface, but the point that's being made here is that when Paul had this issue resolved at the at the level of the apostles and the elders at the, at the Jerusalem church, that the direct result of saying that the Gentiles do not need to worry about the law of Moses and they do not need to be circumcised, the direct result of that was peace, was growth, which means then that the other message that was bring, being uh, brought by these other Jewish uh, people from the Jerusalem church who were causing problems for Paul that their message of you must be circumcised, you must eat kosher, you must keep the Sabbath, you must keep the all the festivals, that that message was not bringing peace and it was not conducive to growth of these Gentile churches because it was imposing upon them things that were unnecessary uh, in their relationship with God. All right, And we need to keep that in mind because any time we try to impose something that is not a requirement from God, we are in danger of doing exactly what Jesus accused the scribes and Pharisees of doing, that is teaching as the commandments of men as though they are the doctrines of God. And a lot of churches do this. They do it with whether or not you know people can dress a certain way, um, certain standards about your haircut, uh, standards about makeup, standards about things that you are not permitted to do that are not forbidden in the scriptures for Christians. Um, you know, things like that. These are human standards. Um, you know, there's one, I don't want to pick on any one particular denomination, but the, the Churches of Christ um, forbid instrumental music and if you have instrumental music in your church you're cast out of their their uh, their group or you're in some cases in extreme cases you're told that you're not a Christian if you have instrumental music in your in your worship service or if you use it even in your private worship and see these are these are the commandments of men these are not the commandments of God and anytime we start to do that and impose things on the scriptures we are in danger of having that Pharisaic kind of an attitude which Jesus himself condemned. You know, one of the things that uh, at Oasis that we do, we, uh, we observe the festivals. In fact, last, last Sunday I delivered a sermon on the, um, why the Sunday worship is not, there is no precedent for Sunday worship as a weekly gathering in the New Testament. Now, some people 
might immediately say we've gone off the other side we have become Sabbatarians now and you know you can take certain denominations like the Seventh-day Adventists or um, other other uh, sabbatical or Sabbatarian I should say um, Christian groups who have taken that issue and have made that issue into the same thing that we see that was happening with circumcision in the book of Acts that is they were saying Gentiles need to keep the Sabbath day or if they worship on Sunday you know the, the Seventh-day Adventists say that that's the mark of the beast and all this kind of stuff and this is not true and um, you know the Apostle Paul one of the reasons why there is no clear commandment in the New Testament for Christians particularly Gentile Christians to observe the Sabbath day or observe any of the feasts according to the law of Moses is because even even something as simple as worshiping on Saturday was not really conducive to the message of the gospel because you know there were there were uh, the gospel was going out into various cultures various uh, places just as it is here in the book of Acts it was breaking new ground in new cultures and new places the Romans at the time of Christ didn't have a at least not throughout the Empire they did not observe a seven-day week see here in America it's easy to say well you have to take Saturday off because you know the commandment is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy but what if your week on your calendar that's used by government that's used by business that's used by your employer doesn't have a seven day week what if they have a eight day week what if they have a ten day week and see in the case of Rome they had a they had an eight day week they had uh, every eighth day was market day and that's the day that the people from in the country would come into town to buy their supplies and their groceries and a lot of businesses would close so that they could go and stock up on things like that and you know if you worked for somebody like this you got every eighth day off that was your day of rest well how can you how can how can uh, a church then expect everybody to get the same seventh day off if it doesn't even fall on the same day of the week every month see because if, it, if you have an eight day week you can't take every seventh day off you have to work that day you know and it's because of these differences in cultures as the gospel was going from place to place that the command to observe the Sabbath day as a command was not something that was included as part of the message of Christ or the message of the gospel is there a place for it yes is there a blessing on the Sabbath yes is it is it great to remember the Sabbath day because of its significance with regard to uh, you know the fact that the curse is going to go on for six millennia and the the seventh millennia is the Sabbath rest yes all those things are important the symbolism but it's just not it just was not practical in uh, many nations and so that's why one of the reasons why God did not require that for the Gentiles so um, anyway let's um, let's keep going it says in verse um, 6 now when they had gone through uh, Phrygia and the region of Galatia they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit or the Holy Breath to preach the word in Asia now Asia here is uh, Asia Minor it's it's not Asia as you think of the Far East it would be um, the western portion of what is today Turkey and um, it says here that they were forbidden it doesn't say how they were forbidden but apparently Paul and Silas and now Timothy with him they expected to pick right up where uh, Paul and Barnabas had left off on her first missionary journey remember they were there in the area of Turkey in the area called Galatia um, uh, and they expected I guess just to continue moving slowly west and continuing to preach from place to place but God was directing Paul God was directing his ministry God knew how much time Paul had and God knew what a um, what kind of a um, mission he had for the Apostle Paul 
and and why he wanted the Apostle Paul to cover a great deal of territory and not just get bogged down in one area. He wanted him to get farther west. And this is what we see happening here. So verse 7 says, After they had come to Mycia, this is part of Turkey as well, they tried to go to Bithynia, another area of Turkey, but the Spirit did not permit them. See, they're trying to go north and trying to go a little bit, hook back east a little bit, that kind of stuff. The Spirit is not permitting them. The Spirit wants them, or the holy breath of God is leading them west, farther west, farther west, into much more unfamiliar territory. See, if they left the area of Turkey, they would be going into Macedonia, Greece, right into the heart of of Greek culture and Greek paganism, and that's where God wanted them. So, so verse 8, so passing by Mycia, they came down to Troas. Now, Troas is a city of um, on the air in the area of Turkey on the on the farthest northwestern tip of the area of Turkey from there you would then be moving more into uh, Macedonia all right if you if you go beyond that point verse 9 a vision appeared to Paul in the night a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him saying come over to Macedonia and help us so you can see you can see the interaction that God is having by means of his spirit or his breath with the early church in getting and nudging them and getting them to move. See, Paul wants to go this way. God says no. Paul wants to go another way. God says no. And now Paul goes to bed and he has a dream and there's a man in Macedonia saying, come over, help us. Come help us. And so Paul took this as the voice of God. Verse 10. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, I want to point out something here in this passage. I want you to notice, back at the beginning of chapter 16, it uses third-person pronouns. Or, I'm sorry, third-person verbs and, uh, and pronouns. It says... In verse 16, or chapter 16, verse 1, it says, He, that is Paul, came to Derby and Lystra. And then he picked up Timothy there, uh, and so forth. Um, if you go down to verse 4, it says, Then they, third person, um, went through the cities. They delivered to them the decrees. Alright, what does that mean with regard to the person who's writing this account? We know that Acts was written by Luke, same, the same man who wrote the Gospel of Luke. But he's using third person. What does that mean? When he says, he did this, they did that, they left here, they went there. What is it saying? It's saying that Luke, the writer, is not with them when he wrote that. He's writing the history of what happened, but he was not an eyewitness to those things. Okay. But now, look what happens when they get to Troas. It says, uh, they, they, uh, verse 8, So passing by Mycia, they came to Troas. And this is where Paul had his, had his vision. And then verse 10, Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we. Now I want you to notice the word we there. You should circle that. The word we. Because now, it's at this point, it's when Paul and Timothy and Silas are at Troas, that we see that Luke now joins the team, even though it's not stated there. But because from this point up until where later we'll see that Luke is left behind in another town, it's from this point that the writer is giving an eyewitness account because he was there. He was traveling with Paul. All right. Okay, so verse 10, it says, Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us, again, first person, to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, sailing from, Tro uh, from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis. From there to Philippi, which is a foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. Now, when it says it was a colony, it means it was a Roman colony. This was, a, this was, this was like little Rome out in the 
east, quite a bit east of Rome. But this was a place where there were many Roman officials, there were uh, many uh, uh, Roman military presence was here. Um, it was sort of like an outpost of the city of Rome, but it's out at the farthest edge of Macedonia. So when you come from the area of Turkey, Asia Minor, and so forth, and you take a ship, and you cross over that little, that little stretch there, and you come to Philippi, you're coming to the gate or the entrance into more what you would call Roman territory where Rome had its primary presence and uh, so that's uh, that's what that's why it says it was a colony and we were staying in that city for some days that is Luke Silas Timothy and Paul and on the Sabbath day we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made now why is Paul going there and it's because the city of Philippi did not have a synagogue. There was, there was a Jewish presence there, but there was not enough of a Jewish presence in Philippi for there to be a synagogue. And so, in place of a synagogue, there was a, a location, probably like a little park or something like that, down by the riverside, where normally the Jewish women would go, and they had a little, kind of a little place where they would pray. And so when Paul and and his companions found this out they decided to go down there maybe they could find some Jews that they could evangelize so uh, on the Sabbath day we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there now that that implies that this was a regular gathering now a certain woman named Lydia heard us she was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira. Thyatira is one of the cities back in Asia Minor where uh, Paul wanted to spend some time preaching but the Spirit wouldn't allow him. Um, who worshipped God. And that phrase, who worshipped God, means she was a Jew. All right? She worshipped the God of Israel, the one true God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Now, what we have here is the beginnings of a Christian church in the city of Philippi. This large, it's a large Roman colony, it's a large city of Philippi, and now we have the first convert. It starts with a Jewish woman and her family. It says her whole household was baptized, so we assume that that means her husband as well. And so she invites the Apostle Paul and his traveling uh, team to stay at her house. And no doubt they're um, having a, a great time of Christian fellowship at her house. But do they then abandon going down to preach back by the riverside where the other Jews were gathering? No, they don't abandon that. Let's continue reading. Um, um, where was I? Okay, and on this uh, verse uh, 14, uh, no, 15. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house this day. So she persuaded us. And it happened as we went to prayer. So they're going again to prayer, and they're going back down to the riverside where the prayer was customarily made, all right, for the Jews. As we, as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling so she was this is a demon possessed girl this girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation now is there anything wrong with what she said is anything that she said untrue it's not it's not untrue at all look what she's saying She's following them, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God. They indeed were. They proclaim to us the way of salvation. That's indeed true. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Now, here's the question. Why, first of all, was a demonic spirit 
proclaiming the truth about Paul and Barnabas. You know, Satan and his minions don't do anything unless it's advancing their cause. How would proclaiming that Paul and, and uh, Silas and Timothy were, and Luke now, were servants of the Most High God and were preaching the true message of salvation, how would that benefit Satan and his kingdom? Satan's a very crafty foe. Very, very crafty. And he knew that God was doing something significant in the city of Philippi. What was this demon doing through this girl? He was insulating himself. He was taking some of the credibility of Paul and Barnabas, I'm sorry, Paul and Silas and, and uh, Luke and Timothy. He was taking some of that to himself because he was predicting or acknowledging these things that were true. And even though what was being said was true, the Apostle Paul did not allow it to continue. He cast that demon out um, of that girl. Verse 19. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone. See, Paul pulled the plug on their little scam that they had running there. Um, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city and they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or observe then the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods and when they had laid many stripes stripes on them they threw them into prison commanded the jailer to keep them securely having received such a charge he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. And this is because... The Romans had very, very, very severe penalties for the guards if they allowed any prisoners to escape. It was their life, and they were, they were, um, they were killed for it. If you know, if the whole prison got emptied out, um, boy, they were going to be in serious trouble. Well, um, Paul called out with a loud voice, verse twenty-eight, saying, "Do yourself no harm, for we are all here." Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, you know, what is it What is it that got this guy's attention, this jailer in, in Philippi, this Roman soldier? What is it that got his attention? Well, no doubt, first of all, he overheard Paul and Silas in their prison cell and instead of grumbling and complaining or moaning and groaning and remember they had been beaten with rods they said earlier so they were they were uh, beaten up pretty badly all right a lot of injuries instead of griping and complaining about their unfair treatment um, what do they do they're singing hymns to God and praying they were not phased at all by their persecution because they knew who they were serving. And so this man was, this jailer was very impressed by that. But here he is also impressed by the fact that there's this great earthquake. All their chains fell off and all the doors are wide open. And yet they did not flee the prison. Why would they not flee the prison? I mean, that's the perfect opportunity to escape. Why not escape? Well, maybe it was because they knew what would happen to their guard if they did their jailer he would be executed and they didn't want any harm to come to their own guard so he said notice uh, Paul called with a loud voice saying do yourself no harm for we're, we're all here now this man was shaken <laughs> literally and figuratively 
He brought them out and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Now, why would he even ask such a question unless he had been listening to Paul and Silas, their prayers, their praise, and all of this he had heard? Not only that, no doubt he was aware why they had been thrown into prison, beaten with rods and thrown into prison in the first place. And that was because they had cast a demon out of this girl who was a, a fortune teller. And she had been going around saying, you know, these men are servants of the Most High God. And, uh, and Paul was not, uh, he didn't use that to his advantage. Instead, he threw that demon out of that girl. All this, no doubt, was known to the jailer. All right. Um, anyway, it says, verse 33, uh, 32, sorry. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. Oh, I'm sorry, I, did, I didn't read verse 31. Um, let's go back to 30. So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. So, you know, a lot of people point to this passage of Scripture and they say, Well, look, what do you have to do to be saved? What's the minimum requirement to be saved? And so they point to this verse uh, where this jailer says, Sir, what must I do to be saved? And then, with, and then they point to Paul's answer, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved in your household. So there, the argument is, look, you don't have to be baptized. You don't have to repent. All you have to do is believe, and you're safe. You're a Christian. But why then does it say they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house? So you see what's happening here is the statement believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved you and your household is is only a it's a summary statement of the essence of the gospel message it's not every detail of the gospel message because it goes on to say that they continued and they continued speaking the word of the Lord to them so they filled them in on all the details and it was after they filled them in on all the details that they were baptized now, does the statement, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, does that statement exclude repentance? No, it doesn't mention it specifically, but it doesn't exclude it either. Does it exclude baptism? No, it doesn't mention it specifically, but it doesn't exclude it either. So why were they baptized? Because that was part of the message when Paul continued speaking to them and preaching to them was part of the message that they um, received and obeyed. All right, so it says, um, he took them that same hour of the night um, and he washed their stripes and immediately he and all his family were baptized. They were baptized because that was part of the message that Paul preached to them. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Now, I want to point out something that a lot of people miss, and that is that Jesus said <clears throat> about those whom he was going to send out to speak and to preach his words, that those who receive you, you disciples, they're receiving me. And those who receive me are receiving the one who sent me, that is the Father. And so, repeatedly, Jesus made it clear that the manner in which someone either receives or rejects his messengers, that he considers that to be receiving or rejecting him. And the way in which a person shows that they are receiving Jesus' messengers is by hospitality. We see this in Matthew chapter 10, when Jesus sent his disciples out the first time. Um, he told them, uh, you know, I have to take anything with you, and I want you to go into, you know, enter into a, a town and into a house, and if they will receive you, then you stay there in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you. So you're to stay there, and and the point is that they are going to supply your daily necessities of food and drink and and shelter. Um, and that this is called receiving Jesus' apostles there. You know, Jesus said in 
I'm sorry, John said in uh, John chapter 1 that uh, he came to his own and his own received him not. And that's certainly a good summary statement of how of the reception Jesus got from generally from the Jews. But then it goes on to say, but as many as received him, Jesus, to them he gave the power to become sons of God to as many as believed in his name. And we see this idea of receiving him into their homes, receiving him by providing you know, food for him, a place to stay, these kinds of things. That kind of receiving is what the Bible is talking about when it's talking about receiving Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of people think that that um, when you when the Bible talks about receiving Christ, it's saying a little prayer and asking Jesus to come and live in your little heart. All right? And that that's receiving Jesus in your heart by saying a little prayer. That's nonsense. The Bible doesn't have anything at all to say about saying a little prayer for Jesus to come and live in your heart. All right, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Receiving Christ, it is a biblical term, but it's not talking about receiving him in your heart. It's talking about receiving him by providing hospitality to him or to his messengers that he has sent to us to preach the good news of the kingdom to us. Receiving Christ means receiving his messengers and receiving the message of his messengers and that was done by showing hospitality. And this is why in the parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew chapter 25 Jesus says, you know, he says that when Christ returns he sits upon the throne of his glory that before him is going to be gathered all the nations he's going to separate them as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And he's going to say to those on his right hand, the sheep, he's going to say to them, um, you know, they're going to, uh, he's going to say, uh, you know, I was hungry and you took me in. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was, I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison or sick and you visited me. And they're going to answer and say to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or naked or sick or in prison and ministered to you? And he's going to, and Jesus is going to say to them, inasmuch as you did it, to the least of these my brothers, and he is referring to his disciples, those whom he sent out on his mission with the message. He says, if you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. That is, if you have received them by, in, in this, in, in the way you can show that you're receiving someone, that is by hospitality, providing for their needs so that they can continue on their mission, that that is in fact receiving him. This is what Jesus said. All right, and so what we see here is a perfect example of that with the Philippian jailer. What does he do? He <laughs> he bring, they're, they're in the middle of the night. He brings them to his house, knowing that he's not supposed they're not supposed to leave the prison. But he brings them to his to their house. He's they preach the message to him. Him and his whole household are baptized. And what does he do? He takes care of their injuries. He sets food before them. It says here so that they could eat and they could drink and they could get some physical care and then uh, and then he takes them back to the prison apparently all right um, let's go down to verse um, and verse 35 well let's read verse 34 again now when he had brought them into his house he set food before them and he rejoiced having believed in God with all his household and when it was day the magistrates sent the officer saying let those men go so the keeper of the prison reported these things these words to Paul saying the magistrates have sent to let you go now therefore depart and go in peace but Paul said to them they have beaten us openly uncondemned Romans and have thrown us into prison and now do they put us out secretly no indeed <laughs> Let them come themselves and get us out. <laughs> I like Paul. And the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from their city. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they, they encouraged them and departed. You know, this is um, 
this is the this is the founding of the first church in Macedonia this is Paul now has gone farther than he has ever gone before away from Israel he's out now right in the middle of Greek culture in Macedonia um, here in this Roman colony city of Philippi he's established a church with Lydia and her family with the Philippian jailer and all of his household so he's got two he's got two households which you know they, they could have had very large families it's a very interesting mix in this church isn't it you've got a Jewish household and you've got a Roman soldier and his household now together as the first church the first Christian church if you will of the city of Philippi you know it's really remarkable if you read if you read the book of Philippians the, um, Paul wrote the book of Philippians much later but he he wrote it from Rome while he was in prison later and um, he wrote and he he was commending over and over again he commended the church in Philippi this church here that you see starting here in Acts chapter 16 he commended them over and over in fact he he pointed out that they and he was um, being persecuted and he was in trouble that they were the only church that that sent him donations on a regular basis so that he could uh, take care of his needs you know they not only did they take care of his needs this, this uh, Philippian jailer um, and his family take care of Paul's physical needs while he was there they that whole church continued to take care of Paul's physical needs to minister to him and his needs on his mission when Paul went from place to place they did this continuously as far as we know throughout the rest of Paul's ministry they supported him and they supported him in very tangible ways in fact there was one man that Paul mentions in um, in the book of Philippians who traveled all the way to Rome to bring the donation that the Philippian church had for Paul while he was in prison in Rome and finding out that it wasn't really quite enough to cover his expenses because Paul was at the time at that time he was um, it's in, you can read about in the last chapter of Acts he was um, he had his own high it says his own hired house so he was he was actually renting a house so that but it was under guard he had and, and no doubt that cost money you had to pay to have Roman guards stationed at a house and he had to rent the house so it, rather than being cast into the dungeon because this way Paul people could come from all around and hear Paul speak <laughs> so he was able to conduct himself from his prison which was a hired house with a Roman with Roman guards he was able to continue his ministry even while he was under house arrest in Rome and one of the reasons why he was able to do that was because this church in Philippi continued to support him throughout the remainder of his ministry and this one man that I mentioned earlier that uh, came to Rome he found out that that um, the the gift that they brought was not enough to cover Paul's expenses and so what did he do he started working in Rome himself in order to supply the the rest of the money that was needed by Paul to be able to pay his expenses while Paul was being while was there in prison and uh, Paul even mentions the fact in Philippians that this guy nearly worked himself to death that he was sick in Paul says even unto death or almost to the point of death and why was he doing that because he was working all hours to meet Paul's needs as a minister of the gospel now that really shows commitment that re that's that is the epitome of receiving Christ's messengers and in effect receiving Christ himself and this is why Jesus said to the sheep on his right hand enter into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world because I was hungry and you gave me food I was thirsty you gave me drink I was sick and in prison and you visited me I was naked and you clothed me and um, he said if you've done it to the least of these my brothers you've done it to me so let's keep that in mind as we um, entertain as we provide for as we continue to um, help those who are fully committed 
to preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right? Goodbye, and we'll see you next time.